Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll go ahead and get started um, and let people gather in as they come. Uh, just I want to just give you a few quick housekeeping items before we get started, um, before um, we introduce our speaker, Emily. So welcome. My name is Maggie Chopaday. I am the Senior Associate Director for the UVA Clubs Program at UVA. So I work with various clubs around the world and um, the UVA Entertainment LA Club is um, one of those that I have the honor uh, to be able to work with. So um, before we get started, a few things just to make sure that you know, to make sure that this is a pleasurable experience for everybody. Um, please make sure that, you're, um, that you are in mute. You are welcome to have your video up so that you can say hello. We love to see faces, um, but please make sure that you are on mute. Uh, we will be recording this session, and so we just wanted to make sure everyone aware this will be aware that um, this is going to be recorded, and we are going to share this on our website. Um, also, what you'll notice is I will be pinning Emily as she speaks so that you'll be able to see her full screen, but so you know on the right, right hand corner all the way in the top, um, you have the option to do a view, which is a speaker view and a gallery view, and that will allow you to be able to see um, see her well as she speaks, um, or you can also see everybody gallery view, you'll be able to see everyone's boxes and say hello. Uh, we will also have a time of Q&A. Um, we're going to um, have you put your questions in chat. Please feel free to do that as we go along. Um, we will make sure to capture those so that you can we can ask Emily. And other than that, just enjoy the program. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Justin. Um, so that he can introduce Emily. Justin, would you like to get started? Hi everyone, thank you, Maggie. Uh, my name is Justin and I'm the president of the UVA Entertainment Club of LA. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome Emily today. Um, Emily grew up in Jacksonville, Florida and graduated from UVA uh, with a Middle Eastern Studies degree with distinction in 2001. She pursued her major expecting to go into the Foreign Service, but was heavily involved with the drama department during her time and at the encouragement of her professors auditioned for and was accepted into NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. That's where, that's where she earned her MFA in acting. Uh, she can currently be seen as the armor in Disney Plus's series, The Mandalorian, as Natalie Pierce on SEAL Team, or as I hope this, I'm saying this right, Amra in Supernatural. She's also appeared in TV screens all over the place, as well as on stage. She most recently played opposite Tom Hanks in the Shakespeare Center of Los Angeles production of Henry IV, Parts 1 and 2. Uh, she's married to actor Chad Kimball, who is in Broadway's Come From Away, or at least he is when Broadway is actually up and running. So without further ado, I'm happy and pleased to present Ms. Emily Swallow. Thank you. Um, thank you, Maggie and Justin. And oh, wow, yeah, now I'm big on my screen. I'm gonna hide that. Um, hi, I am, am excited to be here in this weird um, Zoom reality that we're in with you guys. We were just talking about how uh, how even though we are very, very disconnected from a lot of people in our immediate vicinity, this whole like Zoom video teleconference thing is making it possible to see people that we wouldn't normally see. So um, yeah, I, um, I am currently in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm at my parents' house. I was actually just upstairs going through, every time I come back, I try to like throw out more stuff and sort of, you know, give my mom permission to get rid of stuff that she's holding on to for me. And I came across some of my notebooks um, from my time at UVA and my like my directing uh, notes from my directing class. And um, it's very humbling to <laughs> look at that. Um, but yeah, I was, uh, I was a Middle Eastern Studies major at UVA. And I feel like that's important to tell people because I think, I think one of the reasons that I wound up becoming an actor and sort of the way that I have approached my career the way that I have is because I never felt limited to um, any one thing at UVA. I think that that's such a tremendous strength of the university. Um, the fact that I was welcomed at the drama department, even though I wasn't a drama major, the fact that like, I didn't even have to choose like a straight down the road major. I could do something interdisciplinary. And then um, <laughs> I did, I, it, it's sort of a joke to me now that I, I pursued that whole with distinction thing, because to do that, I had to write a thesis. But by the time in my fourth year, I was needing to work on a thesis. I was also just like, so 
heavily, um, I had so heavily given over to the drama department and my thesis advisor, who was very supportive of all of my theater work. He was always like, just, you know, you're almost done. Just put a little more focus into this thesis and it's gonna be, ah. And I remember um, Betsy Tucker, who, was, who uh, was one of my professors at the time in the drama department. She was one of the ones who read my thesis <laughs> and she read it and uh, you know, she's not one to mince words. And she was like, yeah, you didn't really spend much time on this, did you? So um, fortunately uh, that didn't matter much for what I wound up doing professionally. Um, but while I was at UVA and- yes. Can I just give this back to you? I'll ask it, I'll ask for <laughs> Sure. Um, and uh, getting more and more involved with the drama department. Um, one of my professors, Richard Warner, said, have you thought about pursuing this further? And at that point I knew, I knew enough to know that I loved it. And I had, I had grown up singing and performing and, and there was plenty that I got by with on instinct, but I also knew enough to know that that was not enough for every part that I played. I distinctly remembered when we were doing um, Thornton Wilder's The Skin of Our Teeth, um, James Scales is here. He will remember that. And I was playing Sabina, the maid, and I was lost. I felt so overwhelmed. It's a crazy play. There's all these different styles. And it required a toolkit that I didn't have on my own. And so that's sort of, that was one of the things that planted the seed for me saying, yeah, I think that I would benefit from really focused concentration on this. And so um, I auditioned for a bunch of different graduate acting programs. I got into NYU. I went right away from undergrad, which was great because that's when the opportunity came up. But it was also really challenging because um, like a lot of people at UVA, uh, I was you know, very um, achievement oriented and and that was sort of like the easiest way for me to know if I was doing well was whether I got the good grades or I got the approval from the, the professor or yada, yada, yada. Um, and they really, they called me out on that when I got to NYU. And I'm so glad because it was something that I needed to hear definitely as an actor, but also just as a human being. Um, and they, you know, they said to me, it seems like you were trying so hard to get things right and like to do what you think we want you to do. And they said, if you, if you approach your acting work that way, uh, A, you're gonna be really boring and B, you're gonna get bored. You're not going to enjoy the work that you're doing. You're never gonna surprise yourself. And they said, you have to be willing to fail. And I was like, what? <laughs> Failure? No, that's not, I, did, I didn't understand and like the freedom that comes with that willingness to fail and sometimes failing. Um, not to say that like, oh my gosh, I'd, I'd had plenty of failures before, but I, I just didn't, up until then, I didn't understand how that could serve me and make me better. It always felt like a failure was something to be corrected. You know, I would make up for it next time. Um, but now I totally so appreciate that. Um, in life and as an actor. And, and I remember reading an interview once with, uh, I think it was Philip Seymour Hoffman when he was working on a play with Mike Nichols. Um, it was one of the Chekhov ones, I think the Seagull in Shakespeare in the Park. And he was talking about how he would get up there and he would rehearse like all these different um, ideas for scenes that he knew were bad, but he had to actually go through them and feel them in order to get him out of his head so that he could either move on to the next thing or be inspired by something that came up with that bad idea and then find like the next idea for the scene. Um, and I appreciate that so much. And I feel like, I feel like I get to learn so much about how to be a better human person in the world, working on characters and um, in creativity with other people. And I think that that also was really nurtured at UVA. Um, I just felt like, I feel like the drama department there, especially because it's not, it's not a school that you like go to if you know, like you wanna be an actor and that's the thing you wanna do. Um, I feel like it, it collects such a wonderful assortment of people who are in the drama department and it is open to so many ideas and it is, um, it really pushes you to think outside the box, to try things you're uncomfortable with. And that was one of the reasons that I 
chose NYU over some other programs because I had heard that they, whereas some programs try to fit you into a mold of like, of, you know, different acting styles and what kind of actor they think you should be. Um, NYU does not let you hide, or at least the NYU that I went to. It, you really have to tap into your strengths as an actor and you have to find your voice and you get um, all the different tools for your toolkit, which is what I was wanting, but then it's on you to decide what to do with those. And there's a, you know, you, you spend time creating your own piece. Um, there's a lot of challenges that have nothing to do with just getting up and doing your scene and scene study class. And that also was kind of terrifying to me because I'm, I'm somebody who, uh, I, you know, I, I feel, I feel so much safer when there's like set boundaries and I know like, what is the world of this play and who is this character I'm trying to be? So I'm glad that I had those challenges when I was in grad school. Um, and then, and I, you know, again, I think that that started at UVA and I've definitely seen that carry over into my career because I have never had an idea of like what kind of actor I'm supposed to be. I've been open to a lot of different experiences. I've never felt like I had to choose between theater and TV or um, voiceover or video games. Like, you know, there are people who excel in each of those individual things and good on them, but I love getting to do all those things and bringing things from each of them into the next experience. Um, so I went to NYU, I started my work. Oh, I, I should also point out that I, I started NYU on September 10th of 2001. Um, so that was a really interesting time to be in the city. And I think that uh, in a way, I mean, in terms of starting my career as an artist, the gift of going through that intense period in the city was that we had no doubts whatsoever about the importance of what we were doing as storytellers. And it really solidified the kind of, of artists that we wanted to be in, in my class. And it solidified um, the way that we were willing to support each other. I feel like, you know, the, the flavor for every class going through a conservatory is different. The flavor for every, every cast that you wind up in is different. And I, just felt so much support from my classmates. And, um, and I felt like we were all willing to be there to hold each other up. And I am so grateful that I got to experience that because now that's something that I try to take into whatever environment I go into. And, and what I, the people that I work with who I most admire, I also see the ones who do the best work are not the ones who are, you know, selfish and, um, like so precious about like getting, you know, their coverage and doing their work. Like they're very collaborative. Um, they want to work with other people. They're interested in other people. They're gracious. And, um, and so I'm, I'm grateful to have had that on display for me so that when I'm tempted to like kind of hide out or feel shy or whatever, I remember that all of our work is better if we're not so worried about ourselves and we're worried about um, being in service to the work and to the other actors and to the project and so on and so forth. So um, I finished NYU and at that point, I didn't think I had any interest in doing television. I loved theater so much. I love the rehearsal process. I love being on stage in front of an audience. Um, and so I mostly did regional theater at first, some little shows in New York. And then I did sort of start auditioning for television. My first <laughs> TV gig was on the soap opera Guiding Light which was a trip. Um, I don't know how soap actors do it. Um, it is really trial by fire, but it was fun. And I enjoyed this different challenge where like your rehearsal process is like five minutes long. And um, you really have to, for me, whenever I'm doing television, because you often don't get much rehearsal, I have to do all that rehearsal on my own before I ever get to set. But I enjoyed it enough that, and, uh, and also by that point, I'd recognize the obvious economic incentive of doing television over just doing theater. So um, I started kind of going back and forth between New York and LA that, at that point. And I have a love affair with both cities. Um, I, I cherish them both for such different reasons. And 
people are always asking me which one I like more. And it truly just depends on like what season of life I'm in or, or what season of weather, because I hate New York in the winter. Um, but I, I love the differences between the two cities and I love the challenges that come from each of them and, and what that means for the work that you're doing, what that means for how you collaborate with other people. And so I've always loved going back and forth. Um, and I, I was mostly in New York for the first few years and then sort of traveling out to LA and I was doing more television, you know, little guest spots, finally like a recurring thing. And then I got my first series regular job um, on a show called Monday Mornings that almost nobody saw. It was on TNT. And if you're going Monday Mornings, what a horrible name for a show. It is a horrible name for a show. But that was the name of a novel that Sanjay Gupta wrote about, you know, this, his, his world of, of hospitals and drama happening in the hospital. And, um, and it was centered around these meetings that happened on Monday mornings, which were essentially like sort of doctors having to go on trial and defend the choices that they'd made through the week before. And I got so spoiled on that show Partly because I was working with these incredible theater actors. Alfred Molina was on it. Bill Irwin, who had been a guest artist when I was at UVA, was on that show. Um, and so I was really spoiled because it was a very, it was a very like open and gracious and, and, you know, you could talk about questions that you had with the director forever and other actors wanted to collaborate. I've since learned that not every set is like that. Um, but I just feel so lucky that I got to kind of sit back and watch other actors' processes. And, and that's something that I, I've tried to do more and more on TV sets, because it can be easy to feel like you're just supposed to like go sit in your trailer and wait until it's your turn to get up there. And then, you know, you go back and um, I just, I, I get to learn from other actors in a rehearsal process for theater. And so in order to do that in TV, um, I guess you kind of have to be a little more creative and find a, a workaround and sort of like, you know, hang out where people are. It's weird too, when you're, when you're an actor and you're just like hanging out at Video Village watching the scene, people are constantly wondering if you need something or if there's a problem, like they, don't, they think it's bizarre that you just want to watch. Um, but uh, at that point I was, so at that point I had sort of committed to LA and I was out in LA for several years. Um, and then I, I'm trying to figure out like what's actually important to say. Um, five years ago, I met a guy who is now my husband, who was doing a show down at La Jolla Playhouse. And I went to see the show because I had some other friends in it. Um, that show was called Come From Away and it was the first out of town tryout. It is still running when Broadway is actually happening, it's running. Um, so we had a long distance relationship for, until we got married. So two years ago we got married and I moved sort of like officially moved back to New York because he couldn't travel. So, um, it was nice to be back in the city again. And it was nice to be back a little more consistently after having just sort of dabbled in it for a few years. Um, but I was still mostly working out in LA and Vancouver. Um, and now that this whole COVID thing has happened, uh, we gave up our apartment because we don't know when my husband's going back to work and we've been in LA where I have been back at work on a show called SEAL Team, um, with all of the COVID protocols, which I thought was going to be really weird, but which is actually fine. Um, mostly I think because everyone has such a good attitude about it and we're just so all, we're all so grateful to be back at work. So, you know, there's testing three times a week, you wear a mask all the time. Um, they're not working COVID into our storyline, which I'm kind of glad for. I think that it works for some shows. And then there's some shows where like, I'm gonna be so relieved that I don't have to see what they do with COVID. Um, and it, it's, been, it's been interesting to be, you know, back at work, but not feeling quite as, as free as you, you normally feel, which I guess is how we all are in the world right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're out in LA a little bit and we're spending time with our families, which is why I'm here in Florida. My husband's from Seattle, so we've been spending time up there. Um, so that's like a super quick overview of, I guess, how I got to this spot right here with 
I have to invite my friend here. Um, this is the armorer who is a character that I play in The Mandalorian. And I did not, I'm not responsible for this. My father went on Amazon and bought this all on his own. I didn't even know he was doing it. And then uh, he sent me a picture of it. And now every time I come home and I walk into a room where she's standing, I get completely freaked out because it's a full-size person. So uh, she's here to answer questions if you have any. I'm here to answer questions and I'm just curious to know, I don't know what you guys want to know. So that's me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Emily. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions from people uh, from when they registered, but if anyone else has any questions, feel free to launch them in the chat. Um, so uh, the first question is, where are you finding artistic inspiration in the industry shutdown? Who do you, um, who, we, we'll, we'll tackle that one first. Oh, okay. Um, where am I finding artistic inspiration? It's been, there've been a few different, now that we've been in this, this lockdown thing for a while, there've been a few different periods for me. I think at first I was feeling so excited because I would finally have time to work on some projects that I've been wanting to do for me. Um, I've been wanting to make an album for a while. I've been wanting to write something with my husband, but then there was inevitably that period, well, inevitable for me, I don't know if everyone goes through this, where I was like, oh my gosh, I have all this time that I could be doing this and I feel like not at all inspired. So I feel like the inspiration I've gotten has sort of, it's been from partly seeing like what people are creating, even in this, this strange you know, lockdown time. Um, it's definitely been from taking advantage of, of a lot of the, the online resources, like getting to like look at art museums online, you know, these virtual tours that you normally wouldn't have and um, trying to take in things on the screen that are not just Zoom meetings, although that also has its place. I was telling Justin and Maggie before we, started that uh, a director that I worked with 10 years ago at the Old Globe started this um, back in April. He started this Thursday night Shakespeare workshop and it's still going and it keeps like evolving into all these different things. And it's act some actors that I know, some actors that I've never met from all different um, points in their career and all different levels of experience with Shakespeare. And I feel like it, in addition to connecting me to Shakespeare, which I love, it's also just made me it's, it's one of the things that's given me um, an opportunity to grow as an actor during this time because I'm getting to work on text consistently with the same people week after week. And I think that getting, getting to work like in a company of people, I think is vital for getting better because um, they know all your tricks. Um, they can remember what you've done from scene to scene. And I think that that's where you get the best feedback. So that has definitely been uh, a source of inspiration for me. And then also just completely taking a break from anything industry related or acting related or, or whatever, because normally um, I don't get to do that. And my husband definitely doesn't get to do that because he gets like at most a week off at a time. He gets two weeks off a year. So we drove across the country two times. We drove from uh, Jacksonville, Florida up to Seattle and then we drove back and we went through all these national parks and we went camping and oh, just getting to like be out in the open without a mask and breathe and yeah. see nature was incredible. Um, so I've actually, I think because I, I love my work, I love what I do and I can get so like just tunnel vision about it. It's been really good for me to kind of disconnect from that. Um, and I have now like come back around and gotten, gotten working on the music, which is what I was hoping to do at the beginning. So it's happened in its own time. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I sort of had to let go of all these ideas of like the great things I was going to accomplish during that time in order to make room for the things that actually needed to happen. That makes sense. Um, we've got a question from Emmy Ellis. Uh, we often hear about how tirelessly actors audition to book a role. Uh, Emmy's curious about getting into the audition room itself. What was your journey to have access to the audition room? And if it was from an agent or manager, how did you find the representative who hustled for you on your behalf and sent you out on more than one audition every several months? 
Yeah, um, I am very fortunate in that I did a showcase at the end of my um, three years at NYU and I got an agent who I'm still with. So I have always had an agent. That's definitely not to say that it's that I've always had like tons and tons of auditions. And I think, uh, especially when you're starting out, even if you have an agent, I think it's on you as the actor to do the work to find out like what's happening that you're right for and to pay attention to all the people that are working on these things, especially as you start to work more and you build more and more relationships because you find that there are people involved with projects who you've worked with before who might have no idea that you're auditioning. And it's like the more that you can sort of make those connections and just like let people know. And um, I do think that that uh, relationships are so important in this industry. And sometimes that can feel kind of icky because it feels like, oh, well, people only work with people they know. Um, but in the, the best sense of it, I think that it is because like we, we all appreciate community. And so sometimes, you know, we're more inclined to choose the people that we know and we want to work with them again. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I think building relationships. Um, and I think if, you, if you're trying to get an agent, um, I mean, it's such a tricky time right now because I would say like, you need to be performing um, in terms of theater, that's sort of impossible right now. But uh, I know that more and more people are, are just making their own films. And, um, and I've heard about like some, some people having tremendous success with that during this time of, of lockdown, like people who, because uh, there's such a hunger for content right now, since there aren't that many shows filming, and since we have this big stretch of time where there was nothing. So there've been some, some really creative things, I think, that have been created that have kind of gotten people's foot in the door. Um, yeah. Awesome. Um, another question from the chat. This is from Kelly. She said, I loved you as the darkness on Supernatural. You had excellent you. chemistry with Dean. Can you speak about your character development process and highlights from working on the longest running CW show? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's uh, the, the, the final, the series finale is this week. Um, that show was such an unexpected joy for me. And I got to work on so much more depth of character and story than I, than I would have expected. I, I hadn't really watched the show much before I was on it. Um, and I, for those of you who don't know, Supernatural is sort of like X-Files meets Scooby-Doo meets Ghostbusters, these two brothers who hunt demons and werewolves and lions and tigers and bears, oh my, um, every sort of creature. <coughs> and, and it's out there, you know, there, there's no storyline that's impossible, but it also has a really good sense of itself. And I think that one of the reasons it has run for 15 years is that at the core of all that, um, are very, very human stories. And so that's what was most exciting to me about this character who the darkness is supposed to be God's sister. And in, in the mythology of supernatural, uh, God, AKA Chuck had locked her up in a box at the beginning of eternity because he didn't like the worlds she was creating and he wanted the worlds that he was creating. Through some string of events, she was released and, um, and so I was the villain for a whole season and I was looking for my brother who was God and you know, wanting him to own up to what he did. Um, and there was no way that I could, you know, every time I play a character, I have to figure out like what I can connect to. I have no idea what it's like to be someone with superpowers or to be a supernatural being. But one of the beautiful things about that character is that she was obvious in the way that they'd written her that she was, she was angry because she was hurt and she was acting out because she felt misunderstood and she felt like she wasn't being listened to and she wasn't being given a chance. And I could definitely relate to that. Um, and what she really wanted was connection. And again, I think that that's one of the strengths of the show is that no matter what crazy characters they introduce, like they're all longing for this connection. So um, that was like knowing that that was at the heart of it made it a lot easier every time I had a scene where I mean, I feel like for a whole season, almost every scene I was in, I had this like wind machine blowing my hair and there was smoke everywhere. And I had to get really comfortable with just like standing there holding my arm out and trusting that it was gonna look cool once they added special effects when really I just felt like an idiot. Um, 
so <laughs> excuse me connecting to connecting to that real human vulnerability was so helpful um and then it's been it's been cool because so season 11 tied up with with my brother and i sort of reconciling and now it is season 15 and it turns out the big bad of the whole show is chuck god and um and so i have come back and it's been very interesting because i was the bad guy and now everyone's realizing oh actually maybe maybe we should have listened a little bit more to her when she was telling us to watch out for chuck so i get a little bit of uh vindication that way um but honestly i mean the the actors on that show are uh jared and jensen the two guys who have been doing it from the beginning um it's such uh an incredibly collaborative and playful environment and that is a huge deal for a show that's been running for that long because i've i've gone into some shows that have been on for a while and you never know if people are kind of tired because they've been doing it for so long or if they just have a very set idea of how things should happen and you just need to like fall in line with that and um there's so much energy on that set and so much playful collaboration and support and i never felt like i was needing to like fit into their world like they wanted to know what i wanted to bring to it um and so that that also i think really helped with feeling like i could develop that character and make her more than just a the stock villain. Um, and then it, it, it just continued to surprise me every time they wrote something that I hadn't previously known about her. So it was a, a fun thing to discover for sure. That's awesome. Uh, so a, a good segue is what was your experience of shooting the Mandalorian like? Mm. Oh my gosh. Um, so bizarre compared to anything else I've done in some ways, but also so familiar in some ways. I knew very, very little about it. When I was auditioning for it, I knew that it was probably something Star Wars, but I didn't quite know what. And because, I mean, I didn't have a frame of reference since there hadn't ever been a, a live action Star Wars series before. And I'm, I'm glad that I kind of didn't know what it was because I didn't get too nervous about it. And my audition was just, in the room with the casting associate there was nobody none of the you know directors or producers or anyone in there and uh i had these this script like this this i think it was just one scene um with very little context and all it said about her was that she was a, a zen-like leader of a group of people and it said that she was masked um which i was fine with but you know they want to make sure and tell you that up front in case you want to have your face seen um so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just sort of had to create the world that I imagined and in the audition, the Jason, the casting associate encouraged me to try it with a, some semblance of a British dialect, because I guess they had been seeing, originally they'd been seeing British women in their 50s and 60s. So um, I don't know how I wound up getting into the room, but I'm glad I did. And I found out I got it, but it was all like, there was no big fanfare around it because they were still trying to figure out like what this show was going to be, what Disney plus was going to be. And everything is, is still in such flux in terms of like negotiating things for streaming, um, shows. Um, so in that sense, it didn't feel like a big deal. I was definitely not getting like a huge paycheck or anything. There was nothing that suggested to me that it was like star Wars, like in, bright flashing letters um and um to prepare for it i i didn't have access to all the scripts i didn't even get to talk to anyone until a few days before i was shooting all that i really had were these costume fittings that i kept going to um because they had to do like a body cast to make my armor and then as they continued to like build all the all the beautiful pieces of this this costume which i will display for you um, you know, being able to see like what she looked like gave me a good sense of who she was and it was so helpful physically. Um, and then when I got to set, I was shooting, we were shooting the first episode and the third episode at the same time. And those were the first ones to be shot. It wasn't all shot in order, but those were first up. And so all of us were sort of discovering the kind of the body language of the Mandalorians at the same time. 
And I was able to draw from mask work that I had done at UVA and at NYU, you know, this theater training um, for this TV show, which like I never would have expected, but I was so grateful to have that, to have that physical vocabulary, to have sort of a, a sense of awareness of what it felt like to be in a mask and how to communicate in a mask. And it was really fun those first few days because we just, we all um, were just sort of trying things and getting feedback from our directors. And, you know, it, it is a different thing to sort of embody a masked character when you know you're not on a stage where the audience can take in the whole picture. You're at the mercy of the editor's cuts and your character's not always going to be seen. So it's not always clear what's being communicated and what's not. Um, and I found that process really fun to try to figure out. And, uh, and I also, at the beginning of filming, John Favreau had said that uh, he was really leaning into um, the idea of these uh, Kurosawa films, which is something that um, George Lucas had, had drawn from when he was doing the original three movies. So that was helpful to have those images in my mind. Um, and, uh, and it really like, it just felt like such a normal set. Um, there was a lot like the, the, I, of course I had to be quiet about what I was doing. I couldn't tell anybody what I was doing. And whenever we were walking, um, outside of the sound stage, if we were ever outside on the lot, we had to have these big black cloaks on so nobody could see our costumes. Cause apparently there were like some paparazzi photographers who'd gotten, gotten a view of some stormtroopers, and there were things being leaked. So, you know, that was sort of mysterious, but I finished all of my shooting before the show was ever announced. And I'm so glad for that because I just had no idea what a big deal it was gonna be. And I never had a chance to really get nervous about it. And then for several months, I just you know got to see all of the like speculation and, and see all the anticipation build up. And then, um, and then I just got to enjoy it. It was so much fun. It was a little weird being at the premiere because I, I was still like not allowed to say anything about my character. So, I'm like, you know, doing doing the red carpet thing and talking to reporters and not really able to say anything. Um, not that much of importance gets said on the red carpet anyway, but it was it was bizarre. Um, but we got to watch the first three episodes at the premiere and it was just thrilling because partly because I knew so little about the rest of the project. It was so fun to be an audience member and sit back and watch it. Um, but it, it was a really it again was was such a playful, collaborative, like really team atmosphere. John Favreau as the showrunner, he I feel like he's probably always the smartest person in the room, but he never acts like it. He's so interested in other people. He's so interested in what you have to bring to the table. Um, I know he encouraged all of the directors to play to their individual strengths. And, um, and I think that that was brilliant because I love that throughout the, the first season, you know, you can see different directing styles, but it all works together in this cohesive story. Um, so it was a really, really satisfying collaboration, even though I, I knew very, <laughs> very little ultimately about what on earth I was doing. But that also meant I could just focus on the work, which was nice. Uh, was that you during the fight scene or did you have a stunt person? Oh my gosh, I wanted it to be me so badly. And I, <laughs> I got the script for that episode like three weeks before we were shooting it. Cause I guess I was there shooting like the end of three and then we were doing, that was eight, but we were doing it. We were doing them all out of order. And I went, um, I approached Ryan, our stunt coordinator. And I was like, hey, what do you want me to do? Tell me like, what do I need to do to train between now and then? And he was so sweet and he, he was like, that is, that is commendable that you want to do that. There's no way in hell you could learn what you need to learn in three weeks. <laughs> so um, I did, however, work with um, uh, with a, a trainer um, so that I could do some of the transitions um, just because I, I wanted to, because I thought it would be so much fun. And if I'd had the time, I would have like done all the training to do that fight. But it was it was mostly based in a martial art called Kali. And so I worked with somebody on like trying to get a lot of the basics of those moves down. So I was able to do like some transitions, but all of the cool stuff was my, my stunt double. And, and that also meant that like, I didn't know how cool that fight was until I watched the episode at the same time that everybody else was watching it. And my husband and I were sitting there on the couch just with our jaws open. And I was <laughs> like, that's, 
I mean, that's not me, but that's me. But that's not. But whoa, she just made me look so cool. You, I'm such a badass, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, look at me go. Yeah. <laughs> um, from Sylvia, we have the question: um, Have you ever had to develop a character in a series without a character breakdown? What is your process, or would you have suggestions? Yeah, or sometimes I have a breakdown that's just not at all helpful. Um, man, that it's such a challenging thing, and it sort of depends on it depends on what you have to work with. Whatever you have, I think you just have to dig deep into it. And um, I find it so frustrating sometimes, especially with these projects that are very secretive and under wraps. They will they give you so little, and um, and I feel I mean. Personally, I feel like there's some questions that could be answered that would help a lot that they just won't answer. But I, um, I do like if there's one or two important things that I think they might be able to tell me, I do go ahead and ask. I often don't get an answer, um, but I try. But um, if I have a script, I will definitely like go through the script and just comb through um, all the details that I can gather about the character based on interactions with other characters, what other people say about me. Um, kind of my sense of the script as a whole and where I think I fit into that, like how this character serves the story. And then um, I, uh, I kind of sit with that and, and just see like what, what sits in my, like what, what, what gives me the best gut reaction. And then I try to go deeper with that and make up a lot of stuff. Um, and I used to feel really nervous about doing that because I was like, well, what if I'm wrong? What if I like make an assumption about this character that isn't true? But I think when you have very little to work with, like you have to do that or you're gonna, me personally, I'm gonna feel really self-conscious about the fact that I haven't made many choices. And it's probably gonna be kind of a general okay performance. But I think if you take the time to make the choices and. And even if you make up stuff and it winds up being contrary to like what they had in mind, I think like if you can show that you have that imagination and if you're making choices that really resonate with you as an actor, then they're seeing you do good work. And it's not gonna matter like the details of whether you're you know accurate to their idea or it could make them change their mind about the character. Um, so yeah, I, I remember early on, I was so like resentful about that. I was like, why can't they just answer my questions? But then they realized they just weren't going to. And so I had to, had to find a way to work with it. Um, and for me, when I'm working on auditions or when I'm working on, a, on something that I'm gonna shoot, I, I have to collaborate with other people. So I work with a coach, I work with my husband, I work with friends. And um, because for me, like I can sit there and I can write all these ideas about a character, but it's not until I'm actually on my feet um, interacting with somebody else that I get, that I, I get a sense of what actually works or new ideas come out or, you know, the person that I'm working with can give me an idea. And, uh, I love that. I, I mean, I have, I have friends that like, I consistently work on auditions with and we just help each other out that way. And, and I feel like it makes my work so much better than if I just sit there and try to like figure it all out on my own. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's kind of, kind of just goes back to like being six years old and, and making up the world as you go, I guess. Um, from from registration, who do you look up to in the industry or what TV shows or movies do you recommend for someone to watch if they're looking for inspiration for acting? Oh boy, inspiration for what kind of acting? Um, who do I look up to? Well, I was talking about that show Monday mornings and um, Alfred Molina and Bill Irwin um, are just such incredible artists and human beings. And, and working with the two of them on that, and then working with, um, I worked on a, a play with Mark Rylance at the Guthrie Theater. And it was a play that he was acting in and he had co-written and he was co-directing. And it was such a relief to see that, I mean, he is a genius. He's been touched by some muse. Um, but he also is so methodical and works so hard. And this actually sort of goes back to the question I just answered. Um, one of the things that we did as a cast, which is such a simple sounding exercise, but I feel like I've rarely been in an environment where like we've had the time to do this. Um, he had each of us as 
uh, make, a, make several lists for our characters. We wrote down every single thing in the script that our character said about ourselves. We wrote down every single thing that another character said about us. We wrote down facts about our character. Like if we knew, you know, my character I knew was um, a Norse goddess. Um, and then we wrote down intuitions and instincts about our characters. And then we as a company sat in a circle and we, we each had our turn in the middle and we would just read through the list of like everything that our character said about ourselves. We would look at the other actor that we were talking about when we were reading um, what our character said about the other actor. And I don't remember what we did with the facts and intuitions, but it, it's such a simple thing, but actually taking the time to sit in the room and to take the time to go through that list detail by detail was so informative and helped each of us get on the same page as a cast. And so then we were able to do a lot of improvisations together to come up with like backstories to work on parts of the script. Um, and so what I learned from that is um, there, the tedious work is all worth it. And I, I mean, I find this to be so true with auditioning. Like I'm not gonna feel good about an audition unless I work on it for hours, which can sometimes feel like such a waste of time because for the most part, I don't get like the majority of what I audition for. But if there's any chance of it being good, like that just has to be part of the process. So I definitely look up to Mark in that way because I see like he, he's brilliant. And part of the reason he's brilliant is that he keeps coming back to these basic things. Um, and then that frees him up to be even more brilliant. And I saw that same work ethic when I was working with, um, with Alfred and, and with, uh, with Bill, as well as this relaxation and this, one of the biggest things I learned from watching, uh, Fred and his, he would have, he was the chief of staff in the hospital. And so when we would do these, the scenes that were these meetings, which were like essentially, you know, doctors on trial. It was, uh, David E. Kelly wrote the show. And so he would have these like massive monologues um, that would change like on the day. And I watched him go through all that with such relaxation, even when he went up on a line. And I think that there, there is this tendency for a lot of us, especially like when you're on a set and there's a bunch of people watching you and you feel the pressure on, if you go up on a line, like there's this, this tension that enters the body and you stop breathing and I know in my head, I'm like, you know, figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. And there was never that worry with him. He was always so relaxed and he would pause if he needed to pause. And at some point, like the line might come to him or he might come up with something entirely different to say, which may or may not work. But it felt like in staying relaxed and allowing in that breath and not letting that moment of like self-conscious panic to come in, he would then move on to so many beautiful moments that, that they could use. Um, and of course, you know, it didn't matter that he'd gone up on his line because they're going to edit it all anyway. So I think like watching him have such a lack of self-consciousness and not ever feeling like he was on, um, it helped me kind of dial back some of the pressure that I feel when I, cause I do feel that when I'm on a set, when you know, like, especially on a, a fast moving TV show, when you know you're not gonna get that many takes, it's easy to dwell in that place of like, oh gosh, I gotta get this right, I gotta get this right, I gotta get this right, which just winds up backfiring because then you're worried and you're tense. And um, so I'm really glad that I, I got to see these actors who'd work, whose work I already admired so much, to see them be relaxed, to see them make mistakes, to see them not worry about all of that and do that whole failure thing that I'd, I'd heard about so many years ago. Um, that was tremendously helpful. And, and I, I try to keep those things in mind in my own work now. That's a great answer. Um, we've got time for, for two final questions. So uh, from Michael, how do you keep yourself motivated at times when maybe you didn't get a role you really wanted or extended periods of time when you might not have work? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm still coming up with good answers for that. Um, <laughs> oh, there've been so many things that I've loved that I, I didn't get. Um, and it's heartbreaking. And, and one thing that I have learned is that I do have to sort of mourn it. Not every audition that I don't get needs to be mourned, but there are some characters that just stick in there. And I kind of have to like let myself 
feel bad about that, that it didn't happen. Um, I do absolutely have faith that it's all part of a greater arc for me as an actor. And I do trust that the work I do on every audition is contributing to my growth as an actor and is, I mean, one of the great things about auditioning is that you're constantly working on different characters. And so even if you don't get to play that character at that time, having worked on something for a particular audition means that you now have something else in your kind of your bag of tricks that you can pull out for another audition and another character. And so I think that that's an important way to, to sort of like keep going to the, um, I mean, I, I feel like expanding your creativity, I, I have the same idea about it as I do um, my physical fitness. Like I don't go to the gym once a month and expect to be able to like run several miles and bench press my body weight. And like, it just doesn't work that way. And I think that your creative muscles are the same. I think that if you aren't doing anything um, except when you get to, you know, if you're not auditioning much and you don't do anything in between the auditions or you're not, you know, you're not getting to perform much and you're just waiting for when you get to, then you're going to be kind of rusty and you're going to feel pressure to try to like, you know, access that part of you. And so auditions can give you a chance to do that. But then even if you're not auditioning, I think it's important to be either working with other people. And so during those times when I don't have a lot of auditions or I'm not getting a lot of stuff, I'm trying to do things like this, um, you know, this Shakespeare workshop that I'm doing. I go to classes, I do, um, I do clown classes. I do, it's been a while since I've done a scene study class, but uh, you know, I'll do readings with people. Um, that's really important or else when I do get an audition, if it's been a dry spell, then I, I put so much pressure on it because I feel like I've forgotten sort of what it feels like to access those parts of me. Um, but in terms of dealing with the discouragement, it really is like, it, 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 I think it's an act, you gotta have faith that you're doing what you're doing for a reason and that what you're learning on one audition will help you on another one. Um, and it's not, you know, unfortunately, it's not merit-based, it's not, it's, it's so uh, mysterious, like why some people get certain parts. And um, fortunately and unfortunately, like there are so many different versions of a character that could work. So even if I go in with this fantastic idea for a character and I do wonderful work, I'm, I might not get the part. It's very likely that I won't get the part. And another thing that, I, that was helpful to me when I was auditioning um, for the play that I did with Mark Rylance, um, he was in the room for the audition and we did the scenes and we talked a little bit and, and he, he said, well, it's very clear that you could play this part. He said, now what we have to do is we have to put together our group of musicians and we have to see what instruments are going to work together. Um, the musicians being the actors. And, and that's so true. You know, even if I have like this idea of a character that is brilliant, it, could be completely contingent on who they cast in another part and like how those different instruments are going to play together. And that's still really disappointing because I still want like my version of the character to be the one that they choose, but it, it is, you know, I try to trust that like the parts I'm supposed to do are gonna come to me and the other ones, they're gonna go to the person that needs to play them. Um, but I think also because of that, especially when you're an actor and you're, you're sort of waiting you're dependent on auditions to be able to do the thing that you want to do. I think it's really important to bring those things into your life on your own and have projects that you're working on, whether you're writing, whether you're um, uh, doing other people's work, you know, working with writers and helping them create um, directing or something completely outside of acting, you know, something to feed yourself so that you're not just sitting there waiting for someone to tell you you're allowed to do your work. I think that's really important because it's, it's easy to get. I've definitely had periods where I've gotten so bitter and frustrated that like I'm at the mercy of all these other people to get to do the thing that I want to do. And um, so you got to find ways around that for sure. Yeah. Wow. Um, all right. Well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So one final question, and I, it's a good one to go out on. Uh, what have you been streaming and consuming during quarantine? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
I, oh, I was, I was actually going to mention this before when I was talking about things that inspire me. Uh, I just watched um, The Great, the series on Hulu about Catherine the Great, and it's uh, Elle Fanning and Nicholas Holt. And it's, it's, I mean, it's just, it's delicious. It's a delicious thing to consume, but also as an actor, I'm fascinated by it because it is, it has created its own world. You know, it's set hundreds of years ago, but it's very anachronistic um, in very specific ways. And I feel like I can tell that they did a great job of making sure like all the designers and all the actors and everybody was on the same page of what that world was because you never question it, even though there's, you know, completely contemporary things that happen and, um, and these jokes that, I mean, brilliant jokes that are so sly. Um, and the acting is incredible. And it goes from like very campy and like, um, and then it, it, it'll get very emotional and very vulnerable. I mean, I think Elle's performance as Catherine is just brilliant. Um, and it's dark and it's just, and, and then just visually it's, it's delicious. It's so fun to consume it. So that's when I watched, I just finished the second season of Dead to Me. Um, and I watched both seasons of that within like two weeks. And that's, uh, that's another one where I, I love the, I love the ensemble work. The actors um, just work together so well and play off of each other so well. And in reading about the show, I know that like there's there's scenes that they sometimes like because Christina Applegate and uh, Linda Cardelli know each other so well at this point. Um, the writers know that they can like put moments in scenes where they say like, and then you're just going to talk about this for a few minutes. Say whatever you want to say, um, and you can feel that intimacy. And then I finally, I was late to the party, but I finally got on the Shit's Creek bandwagon and watched that whole thing also during quarantine. Um, I feel like I need to get into some documentaries now because people keep telling me about good documentaries that are on. But uh, those, those are the three that come to mind first. Those are three great recommendations. And I love when Dead to Me, Christina and Linda, they didn't even know each other until they got cast in the show. Yeah. And it, it, their chemistry was just instant. It was, it was, it was really good. Um, yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything. This has been a really, really great conversation. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending today's speaker series. Um, as we said at the beginning, a recording of this event will be available on the UBA Club's Global Engagement YouTube channel within a few days. Um, and an, uh, an email should also be sent with a link to everyone who registered. Um, so thank you again for attending. Thank you again, Emily, for sharing your time and your talent thank with you. us. And everyone stay safe and wahoo wah. Wahoo wah. <laughs> Bye, everybody.